Good morning and welcome to our webinar. I'm Julie Taylor from CDC and today I'm going to tell you about how you can improve health care with more effective clinical laboratory test utilization. I will share with you some information today about our program at CDC called Clinical Laboratory Integration into Healthcare Collaborative. But don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to memorize our title. I just hope you'll remember it as CLIC. Today I'm going to tell you about why we at CDC are focusing on laboratory test utilization. I'm going to share with you some information about our CLIC program, including the vision that we have, our team members, and also information on key projects. As you go through the talk today, you will see some slides that look like this that have a question mark on them. At that point, it will be a cue that I'm going to ask you a question and to poll you. So look for this as I go through the talk today, and then we hope to be able to share with you the answers. If you think about what was happening in the 1970s, we only had about 50 laboratory tests for doctors to use. So it wasn't that difficult for physicians to know how to order tests, when to order tests, and how to interpret the results. But if you fast forward to today, there are over 3,000 tests for doctors to use. And it can be quite cumbersome for the, them to keep up with the new lab tests that are coming out every day. As a matter of fact, one physician said, Julie, I have to work with patients all day. I meet with them. I visit with patients. I spend my time with patients all day long. The little time that I have outside of patient care, I focus on learning about what is in my own area, the new articles in my own specialty. I don't have time to look at what is going on in the new lab test area to keep up with new lab tests. And if you think about this, we in the lab, I consider myself as a lab person, we have to keep up with these lab tests and the new ones that are coming out, and it's a challenge for us. So you can imagine that a physician has trouble also keeping up with the amount of new tests that are coming out every day. One study that was done by Schiff et al. interviewed physicians and did a survey of physicians and had them report on their own diagnostic errors. And the study published 583 physician reported diagnostic errors. And they found that there were errors in the ordering process all the way through the interpretation of the lab test process. So we do have physician errors in the laboratory testing area. So we want to be able to work on these to reduce them. Well, you may say, well, what did that cause, what did that do? Did that cause any harm? Well, the study also asked these physicians about their errors. And unfortunately, they did report that the majority of these errors cause some type of harm. Now, 41% of the errors were viewed as moderate, which means that they caused a patient to stay in the hospital maybe a little bit longer. Maybe they ordered more tests than were necessary. But what was alarming was that 28% of these errors were reported as major, which even included death. So we do have diagnostic errors that cause patient harm. Another study found that underutilization is more prevalent than overutilization. We think about the lab that we want to reduce the number of repeat tests. The way our system works, we are not very integrated. So as a patient, you go from one physician to another, and the new physician doesn't know that the first physician had ordered a test. So they order the same test. So you can have the same test 
over and over again. So that's overutilization. And we know that we need to reduce that, and our electronic systems are going to be able to help us with that. But this study reported that there is a problem with underutilization. And they also reported that the true cost of laboratory testing is downstream in that we have over-prescribed for patients, we order surgeries for patients when they aren't needed, and extended hospital stays. What the, the authors reported is that to reduce errors and improve care, you need to improve initial test ordering. Also, clinical decision support tools could be helpful and education. And this study is interesting because you'll see that those three themes are the themes of what I'm going to share with you today about our CLIC program. So they also said that improving laboratory utilization should lead to more effective and cost-effective care. This gets to our CLIC vision. Laboratory medicine is fully integrated in the healthcare system resulting in better patient care and improved patient outcomes. Our goal is to improve laboratory test utilization, to improve the connection between the laboratory professional and the clinician, all for the betterment of patient care. So we're trying to improve these connections through our work with CLIC. If you want to read more about CLIC, I'll have several articles that you will see the web address for during my talk. This is one of the ones I wanted to share with you that was published in Clinical Laboratory News in September 2012, and it was focused on our CLIC work. So you can read more about our project if you would like to go to the web address that is listed at the bottom of the slide. And all of the articles I'm going to share with you today are available free on the internet. We have a work group to help us with CLIC. We're very pleased that we have a group of people that have been working with us for several years. Now, I mentioned that our goal for CLIC is to improve the connection between the laboratory professional and the clinician. So to do that, we have set our work group up so that we have representatives from both of those groups. We have a co-lead, Dr. John Hickner, who is a practicing family physician at the University of Illinois in Chicago, who helps us with the clinician side. As you can imagine, if we were going to work on improving lab test utilization, and we in the lab would say, oh, those physicians need to do this, and those physicians should do that, that won't help because the physician needs to tell us what the issues are and help us with how we can help them. So Dr. Hickner is great at helping us with saying, oh, we can't do that in our environment. We need to do it this way. The other co-lead that we have is Dr. Michael LaPosada, who is a pathologist at Vanderbilt University Hospital. And he helps us with the laboratory professional side. We also have other great members of the work group who help us with our project. And as you see, as I go through the talk today, you will see their names because each one of them lead their own projects for CLIC. Here's a picture from one of our work groups that we had in Atlanta. Every year, we bring our work group together to talk to them face to face about what we have accomplished the year before and what we would like to do for the next year. I also have a team at CDC to help us beyond the external work group that I just shared with you. We have a group of people at CDC, Dr. Nancy Cornish, is a medical officer with us at CDC, and Pollock, who has been with CLIC even before CLIC was around in that she helped us initiate the work of CLIC. Anne Rand is an ORISE fellow, and Pam Thompson is one who has helped us with almost every project that I will share with you today. We also have a manager who's chief of our branch, Dr. Barb Zimbauer, who helps us in support through management. Today, I'm going to share with you some information about our key projects. 
There'll be three projects I'll discuss related to clinician test selection and result interpretation. I'll also share with you a project that we have focused in the area of medical student education. So to get started, let me tell you about the Clinician Test Selection and Result Interpretation Project, the Survey of Clinicians' Challenges. We're very pleased that this study has been published. We have worked to do a survey of clinicians, and we just recently got it published in the Journal of the American Board of Family Medicine. We were very pleased that we were able to get the information in a family medicine journal. You think, well, I'm working in the area of laboratory. We mostly publish to our laboratory audience. But I mentioned we are trying to make a connection between the laboratory professional and family medicine and primary care physicians. And what better way is to publish in their own journal information that's related to laboratory testing and help them with how we can improve laboratory test utilization. You'll see at the bottom of the screen, I have the web address. So this is available for you for free at, the, uh, at this web address. So if you're interested in reading more than I'm sharing with you today, please go to that online address and read more about the article. What we did is the goal was to raise awareness about the challenges clinicians face for test ordering and result interpretation. I mentioned that we had leads for the project that are from our work group. This project is led by John Hickner and Paul Epner. We worked on this project in two phases. Our first phase is that we conducted focus groups targeting family physicians and internal medicine physicians so that we learned from them what the issues were. And we used that information to go to phase two, which was to design a national survey of family physicians and internal medicine physicians to get into some more specifics about their challenges. Here are the demographics characteristics of the respondents. And the main thing I want to point out here is these demographics are very similar to the demographics of family physicians in the United States so that our survey is not biased in this manner. As you see, I'm going to get to our whiteboard to point out, we have about equal numbers of family medicine, internal medicine and family practice physicians. And the age is mostly between 45 and 60 years. And we have a little more male than female. But this is very similar to the demographics that you find in the United States. What we ask physicians is, how many times per week do you see patients? And with those patients, how many times do you order diagnostic tests? And we found that they order tests in about 31% of their patient encounters per week. This was not unusual because in the journal literature, there are reports that family physicians order diagnostic tests about one third of the time. So that was not unusual. But what was unusual and alarming is that test ordering was un they were uncertain in test ordering in about 15% of their patient encounters. And about half that, they were uncertain in how to interpret the results with those tests that they use for their patients. Well, you may think, well, that maybe doesn't sound like very much, but if you calculate, there are over 500 million primary care visits every year and if one third of them are getting laboratory tests ordered, and 15% of the time physicians are uncertain with ordering, that could impact about 23 million patients per year. So it does have implications for a problem that we would like to address. I mentioned that we conducted a survey. 
the survey allowed physicians to write in some comments. So I'm going to share with you some of the comments as we go through the talk today. But this one I thought was very interesting. The question was, when uncertain what clinical lab tests to order for diagnostic purposes, how often do you? One physician answered, look on Wikipedia at least once a week. Now we know that Wikipedia is not reviewed. As a matter of fact, today I could post on Wikipedia, the way to improve laboratory test utilization is to eat what I had for lunch yesterday. And unfortunately, that would be in Wikipedia and nobody would remove it. It is just the way the Wikipedia is set up. So it was alarming to see that one physician thought that was a good answer. I'm going to go through the summary of the findings with you today. We're going to talk about what they do to overcome uncertainty, what are some of the challenges that they face in test ordering and result interpretation, and methods for providing assistance. Before we start, I would like to poll you about a question. Which method is used least often by physicians? I'm going to push this poll out and give you a little bit of time to answer. I hope we will begin to get some responses. So, let's see, okay, we're getting some answers in. I'll give you a little bit more time, since I think we have time, and give you just one more minute till it seems to kind of calm down. Great, what we're going to do, one more. Okay, I'm going to now, I think everybody's just about finished. Any more? Okay, we're going to close the poll and now we're going to... push results. There we go. Well, yes, many of you know that Ask a Laboratory Professional is used the least. So, you know the data from this slide, one part of the data. Let me get back to my whiteboard. And that is Ask a Lab Professional was, was voted on by the clinicians as 6%. So what I have posted here on this slide is the results of the survey where we asked them how they overcome uncertainty in test ordering. And we gave them five choices. And I have only posted the top two choices. So for frequency, it's at least once a week or daily. So 6% of the physicians in the survey said that they ask a lab professional at least once a week or daily. Helpfulness is plotted in this graph from the most helpful on the left to the least helpful on the right. So if you look at what was most helpful to clinicians was curbside consult and then reviewee references refer to a specialist. Those were the most helpful things that they did to overcome uncertainty in test ordering. Now this is a slide showing you the results when we ask them how they overcome uncertainty in result interpretation. Once again, most useful was from the left to the right, and its follow-up with the patient was the most useful. Review patient history, review e-references, and refer to specialists were all things that they found very, very useful. But I would like to point out, just like with test selection, ask the lab professional was the least that they do to when they are uncertain with result interpretation. And we know, being in the lab, if you're in the lab, you know that if the physician were to call you on the phone, you could help them. But they do not think to do this. So what are their challenges? 
there are two different groups of challenges related to test ordering cost factors are one and this is percent of respondents who found this very or extremely problematic patient cost insurance policies limiting things like the type of testing that can be conducted lack of comparable cost information there are studies that show that if physicians see the cost of a lab test when they are ordering, they order less of that test. But I want to caution you that we don't want to just post cost without letting them understand when is it important to order that test. Because it may be more important to order the test even though it is an expensive test. Ordering mechanisms are also a challenge. Different test names for the same test, and they can't find the test name in the test panels. We have a project on different test names that I'll share with you in just a minute. So what are their challenges with result interpretation? Receiving results was one major category. They look to the lab for the results. They look for the lab for the data. They see us as lab data. Results not received in a timely manner. Previous results not easily available. Results are inconsistent with patient symptoms. We found when we talked to physicians that if the results are inconsistent with their patient symptoms, guess what they do? They do disregard the patient results and go with their own instincts about what is going on in the patient. Result report format is also a challenge. We know that there are lab-to-lab -lab variation in normal range and report formats. Lab report format is difficult to understand. And I want to point out the last bullet, not enough information in the lab report. We also asked them whether too much information was a challenge and they said that not enough information was more of a challenge than too much. So if you're going to err on the side of not enough or too much, err on the side of too much because they would prefer to have too much rather than not enough. Some of the, re the responses that we got are listed here. A universal format, simple and easy structure and dispensing with the results and not time consuming will be extremely helpful. I hate getting a three page printout with only a couple of lines of actual results. Now I'm going to share with you about methods that they found were helpful. But before I do, I would like to ask another question to do a poll. And it is, what is the reason to communicate with the lab? What is the most frequent reason physicians communicate with laboratory professional? Preliminary result information, seeking technical assistance regarding sample collection, assistance with follow-up testing, status of missing results. Getting close to a time, I might cut it off, but I appreciate all the voters. A few more coming in. Okay, we're gonna close the poll. Great, so yes. Ask a laboratory, oh, that's the wrong one. Let's close that. Status of missing results, that's right, 71%. We're gonna to go to the next slide. So as you know, reasons physicians communicate with laboratory professionals most often status of missing results, preliminary result information. Once again, they go back to we're the data generators. Less often, assistance regarding sample collection and assistance with appropriate test ordering. I would like to point out assistance with appropriate test ordering. That was the lowest percentage reported for helpfulness. Unfortunately, they don't look to us to help them with test ordering. But assistance regarding sample collection, they found that was the highest 
percentage reported for helpfulness. They know, we know what type of tube to use, so they call us, we can tell them what color tube to use and how to collect the sample. We do a great job with that, and they find that very, very helpful. But least often, they ask us about assistance with follow-up testing. Once again, they don't look to us to help them with test selection. And medical opinion results was also least often. We did learn some things from the physician focus groups that were heartwarming. Here's some quotes. You don't talk to a radiologist or a pharmacist in a hospital. You talk to a colleague. You talk to a lab. It's a black box. I don't think about calling the clinical pathologist. They have not made themselves available to help me. I don't know who they are. For radiology, it's different. I know my radiologist, and I have a personal relationship with that person. So I call him and say, this is what I'm thinking. Is this the right test? But it wasn't all bad. We did find several of the physicians had the same idea that's in this third quote. But if it's an interpretation or discrepancy, then I just call Bob who's in charge of the lab, a good guy, and he knows everything. So if we could all become Bob, then that would be very helpful to the clinicians. We found that when clinicians had a relationship with a professional in the lab, they called them a lot. They utilized that person. So if we could become that person, that Bob, I think then we would be able to break down some of the barriers between the lab and the clinician. So what do they do and what are the methods that we can provide them that would be helpful? I'm going to go to the whiteboard to show you that reflex testing, trending, interpretive comments were all very useful. Once again, usefulness is very or extremely useful. And in this, the available is the percent of physicians said, yes, these were available. So these three things were very available and very useful. But I'd like to point out on this slide, CPOE with electronic suggestions was very available, very useful, but it was not very available. It was the least available of all of the things that we asked them at this time of the survey. So it's very helpful, but it was not available. But over on the right-hand side, CPOE without electronic suggestions was available, but it was the least useful. And that's computerized physician order entry. If it's just available for ordering and it doesn't provide any help, it is not very helpful. So we're hoping that this will be an alert to help us move toward the next level where we can have those type of supports that do have electronic suggestions. We analyzed some of the, the comments from the survey, and 16% of the comments recommended improvements were based on clinical decision support and electronic tools. One of the quotes, I'm sure EMR guidelines, diagnostic algorithms, pop-ups, branching to more information will become a huge in the next 10 years. A uniform, compatible, transferable, searchable EMR will be most important. So at the time of the survey, clinicians did find that clinician decision support tools and electronic tools they thought would be helpful to them. So what can we do? Some solutions. Continue to provide what is useful. I mentioned trending, interpretive comments, reflex testing. They're available and very useful. Also, improve clarity and consistency of ordering systems so that they are easy to use for the clinician. Also, reporting systems. They should be easy to see the results so that they can understand what their next step should be with the patient. So, improve availability of CPOE with electronic suggestions. Improve availability of the other items that they said that were not very available but were very useful, such as electronic prompts 
test characteristics. They like to know what is the characteristic of the test before they order. A dedicated laboratory phone line. We did find that if they could get to a person in the lab that could answer the question, it was very helpful. Many of them said that they don't call the lab because they get put on hold or bounced around and never get a person. Also, algorithms were also very, very useful, but not very available at this time. Another poll question. if I can get to it. What we're going to do is this one is not coming up, so what I'm going to do is go ahead with the next slide. But what I'd like for you to do, I'm going to give you my email that's going to be at the end of this webinar. And if you would like to let me know about your institutions and whether you are offering computerized physician order entry with electronic suggestions, that would be very helpful. We'll go to the next slide. We're going to talk about decoding laboratory test names. This is another project we have with CLIC. And we have a publication out, once again, in an internal medicine journal, this time, the Journal of Gen General Internal Medicine. And it's titled, Decoding Laboratory Test Names, A Major Challenge to Appropriate Patient Care. I will tell you about what is in this particular journal, but you can get the free version downloaded at the website at the bottom of the page. It's led by, this project is led by Lisa Passamont and Jim Mizell. Their goal is to demonstrate the complexity of test selection. We all know that there are no standardized test names for laboratory tests. So therefore, we can have a multiplicity of names for the same test, such as I have here for hepatitis B. Also, they can be very complex. For example, rheumatoid factor is not specific for rheumatoid arthritis. So we don't have any standardized mechanisms to make it where there's one test, so when the physician wants to order the test, they know what the name of the test is. What they did in this project is develop flow chart and tables to demonstrate the complexity of vitamin D as an example and the breadth of the problem, which is not only in specialty areas but in commonly ordered tests, and also the depth of the problem using coagulation as an example. Now we are going to have another poll question. This is, how many different test names are there for vitamin D? 1 to 5, 6 to 10, 11 to 15, or more than 15? And we're going to give you some time for this poll, and then I'll close it. And we appreciate you voting. It gives us some ideas about what's going on in your area. OK, looks like we are about finished. OK, we're going to. As you see, you reported one to five test names for vitamin D. Most of you split that between one to five and six to 10. And 9.8% said more than 15. I'm going to show you on the next slide the number of names for vitamin D that are available. You were right that typically there are only two, meaning that there are two different types of tests that you usually conduct in the lab, but sometimes the physician sees all these different names based on what lab they use, and it can be quite complicated. So there are, uh, on this slide, 19 different names 
for options for vitamin D. And you can imagine a clinician is only want to pick a vitamin D test to order one to help his elderly female patient to see whether she's at risk for osteoporosis. And then they have to figure out which test to order. So it can be quite confusing. I mentioned that we put together some commonly ordered tests to show you that it is a problem, not only with commonly ordered tests, but also in specialties. But this shows you that even a complete blood count with differential can be confusing. I will share with you that some of the physicians have told us in the focus groups that they don't have a problem ordering laboratory tests. They'll tell you, why are you asking us about this? Because they typically order 20 tests. They said, we're comfortable with ordering about 20 different tests that are in their normal experience for the day. But if they get outside of that 20 is where it does become complicated. For example, many of them have told us that, oh, we don't have a problem with ordering coagulation tests, which is my next slide coagulation test, we don't have a problem ordering. We order everything on the menu. So if we could help them with which specific test to order, I think we would be doing a better job for lab utilization. At one time, the coagulation specialists did get together and they standardized the factor. So that made it with factor numbers to make it a little more consistent. But we still have a problem with too many test names, even in specialty areas. This slide demonstrates what you might have to go through in your LIS system if you're getting a new electronic health record, you're going to have to map to all these different names. And as you see, the very first is, the very top, it's a one-to-one -one correlation. And then you get one-to-two, and then many-to-one. And then down at the bottom is many-to-many. -many. So this becomes quite complicated. I will tell you that one of the physicians, Jim Mizell, who works on this project, used this demonstration in this particular slide to share with his electronic health record experts to show them what he wanted to have done when they were mapping their lab test for their new EHR. So maybe you can use it as well. Some potential solutions to this problem could be using something like probably meant some type of name lab test. For example, a set of criteria could be established that could include conditional rules. So for example, if ordering test A, then test B is more likely than test C. Frequency, if A1C or HBA1C is more likely to mean A1, HA1C than H1N1. In other words, it becomes something that is programmed into the system so that you could pick up the right test instead of the wrong test. Accuracy actually typed the way it's meant. So this is all to help with test ordering through the different complicated set of test nomenclature. Another solution could be that it could be a dynamic learning system. I mentioned that we are getting new lab tests on the market every day. We have over 3,000 available today. This system would need to accommodate new tests without it always being having to be reprogrammed. This should sound pretty familiar to you. If you type some examples from this manuscript into an internet search engine, you will find that it offers correct spelling and a list of synonyms. So search engine technology is available for us when we search on the internet to help us get to the right search. So why can't we use this type of technology to help clinicians get to the right test that they want to order? Another project is diagnostic algorithms led by Michael Laposada and Marissa Marquis. With this project, we were going to develop algorithms for selected scenarios and then information technology tools based on those algorithms. So to develop the algorithms, we had three clinical pathologists help us with some 
particular spe specialty types of patients, those with prolonged partial thromboplastin time and normal prothrombin time. And they worked on the testing scenario related only to that type of patient so that a physician would know what test to order and how to manage their patients that have this particular set of testing circumstances. This article has been published and it's in this online library. If you would like to see it, please go there, it's free. The second thing that we worked on was IT tools. I have to share with you, I showed you a picture of our work group at our face-to-face -face meeting that we have in Atlanta. Every year we ask the work group, what would you like to see happen this next year that would make you say, a year from now, you were successful if you accomplished this particular task? And Dr. Ms. Marissa Marquis raised her hand and said, I would like us to develop a smartphone mobile application for these algorithms. I thought, oh, Julie, you work at CDC. We publish MMWR articles. We publish guidelines. We help people with immunizations. We don't have a group of IT people sitting around like at other IT companies like Apple and Google and sitting around working on IT solutions. But I looked at Marissa and I said, Marissa, that's a great idea. I'll write it down. Well, I came back to CDC and found out that, yes, we had just initiated a group of IT experts to help with these types of things. We worked with them through an innovation award that we won because of our proposal. CDC funded this particular work internally, and we now have what's called the PTT Advisor and it's an app with algorithms for the isolated PTT. What this particular app does, and it's available, I'll show you the website and the, the, area, the way you can get this particular application, but it takes this complicated set of algorithms, and this is one of the algorithms that is published in the journal article, but it takes it and turns it into a step-by-step walk through for the clinician. So the clinician doesn't have to pull out a big piece of paper and try to find out where they are. They can use their mobile application, which we are finding that clinicians do more frequently now. So this is a screenshot from the PTT advisor. And the first question, does the patient have prolonged PTT and normal PT? So if you answer yes, you go through the series of the algorithm and you end up with a recommendation. This is another screenshot. And at the bottom of the page, you'll see down at the bottom that there are some menu bars. Those menu bars help you at the bottom of the screen, whether you want to go back, go to the next screen, go to the last screen, restart, or at number five here, we've showed you that's an evaluation review. In other words, this is a complicated algorithm. If you want to find out, well, I maybe forgot what question I answered and how I answered it, it will give you all the questions and your answers. So if you want to change an answer, you can click on a button to change the answer, but it will warn you in case you did that accidentally, which I'm not good with IT, so I have a problem with technology. Sometimes I click where I'm not supposed to. But this particular one allows you to say, okay, I do want to change. And then it will go back to a different part of the tree and allow you to go down a different set of algorithms. If you have an iPhone, we don't have this available on the, other, on the other smartphones at this time, but if you have an iPhone, you can use this quick read code to download the PTT Advisor or go to the Apple iTunes store and you can download it and use it. You, if you're a physician out there in the audience, you can use this and help yourselves as well as other, other of your physicians, or if you're in the lab, you may want to use it and share it with your clinician clients as well. Here is another poll question, and I will bring this up.
do you think clinicians in your healthcare institution would use mobile applications to assist them with test utilization? I hope that we'll find this one is an easy question as well, but I do see that there are some that would not. This, this is very helpful because we're looking at a lot of different IT solutions to help clinicians. I'm going to let this go a little bit longer. Okay, so we're going to close the poll and and push the results out. Great, so the majority of you did say yes, but I'm very interested. Many of you said no. We are also looking into taking the algorithms and putting them directly into the workflow of the clinician. So example would be, the clinician is sitting at the computer to order a test. That is when the information from the algorithm would come up. And it would be during the normal time they're interacting with the computer. So they would not have to pull a smartphone or mobile app out. And this would be possible now that we are going to more electronic and EMRs, EHRs, the data that we have in these algorithms could be pulled into this particular type of application so that the clinician could have the information right there in front of them. But thank you for, for your answers. I'm going to now focus on the last part of our talk, and it's on medical student ed education. To pass, most medical students must know what damaged heart tissue looks like under the microscope after a heart attack, but not what blood tests are needed to diagnose a heart attack. If I'm in the ER with a suspect heart attack, I don't want them to have to do a biopsy to find out whether I'm having a heart attack. I want them to know what lab tests to order. So this study was led by Brian Smith and John Hickner, and it's a survey of U.S. medical schools. Their goal was to raise awareness about the gaps in U.S. medical school curricula focused for laboratory medicine training and determine the amount of instruction about test selection and results interpretation. So they surveyed all U.S. medical schools. A sample question, there's two on the screen. In the preclinical portion of your school's curriculum, does your school have a separate distinct course or is it integrated into the other courses? Another question, please estimate the number of hours of instruction each student receives in your required laboratory medicine curriculum. So the results. 75% of the schools responded, which is good. And very good is that 84% reported some coursework in laboratory medicine. But only 9% reported that it was a separate and distinct course. The median number of hours for required lectures were also minimal. Eight for laboratory medicine and only two more for transfusion. So, their hours for lab training in medical school was 10 hours. And if you compare that to anatomic pathology, and this was a survey that was done in another study, so we didn't compare, this is not apples to apples, but it gives you an idea. The anatomic pathology, there are 61 to 302 hours of training in medical school. But we don't know how to use tests to diagnose a heart attack. So what can we do? Add more lab-centric course material. Define laboratory science and professional roles for users of lab tests. But if we do these things, we have to be cautious. What course material will be eliminated if lab material is added? And who can we work with to help us accomplish these things? So in closing, I want to offer you some ideas of what you can look at in your own healthcare facility. 
You can continue to provide what is useful, trending interpretive comments reflex testing. Find out if your facility has this, and if they don't, see if you can implement it. Also find out whether you have CPOE with electronic suggestions, so that when the clinician is ordering a lab test, help box comes up to tell them about the test characteristics or some information about the test so they will know whether that test is appropriate for their patient. Electronic prompts, test characteristics information. If you can, a dedicated laboratory phone line was found to be very, very useful. I mentioned our projects in the area of developing algorithms. You probably could develop algorithms in your own environment. You could possibly find out what are the areas of need in your own healthcare institution. You could look and see, are clinicians ordering every type of coagulation test on the panel at one time, or are they being more selective in deciding what tests they should order? Maybe you could help them with certain types of test ordering if you find out that they are having problems ordering and there is a problem with lab test utilization in a certain area. Also, we found to improve clarity and consistency of your ordering systems. Also, in providing results in a manner that is easily visible. Nowadays, we are moving to electronic mechanisms that I think results reporting is going to be a new way for us to be able to highlight what are the most important things that we want the clinician to see in this lab report. We don't want to just provide a bunch of language that's kind of hard to find the actual information that they need to act on and maybe with particular types of colors and graphs, there may be mechanisms for us to provide results in a more meaningful way to help clinicians interpret the results. In closing, I would like to offer two quotes from recent articles. Focusing on ordering the right test during initial evaluation, as opposed to reducing repeat testing, may have the greater impact on reducing errors and improving care. Primary care providers should have convenient access to laboratory physicians to assist in laboratory test ordering and interpretation. Now, I would like to offer that I, I think we should go beyond physicians. Many of us in the lab are professionals, and we could provide assistance to clinicians. So I think you could look at this and determine whether there is someone in the lab that is capable and has time to be able to help with this particular set of test ordering challenges and test result interpretation challenges. Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. I challenge you to take at least one thing that you've learned from the talk today and try and implement it in your own environment. If you don't think that any of these items that I've suggested could be helpful, at least meet with clinicians, those who are ordering tests from the lab and find out what are some of their challenges. You can use our survey and the results from our survey to help pose some questions to ask them. Maybe your system and situation are better than many that we found around the country, which would be wonderful. And finally, I have my email address here on the slide and I would really like to hear from you if there is something that you would like to share with me about a positive situation that you have that was able to improve lab test utilization or if you have some suggestions for what we could share with others. We appreciate your time today and with that I'm going to go to questions and answers. Questions. The first one I believe, can I reuse the information on the book, I need permission. I think they're asking, can they use what we provided today? And yes, that that would um, yes, that would be perfectly fine. I believe all of this is available to the public. 
is standardization of diagnostic kit names being done in collaboration with kit manufacturers. I have to tell you, I work at CDC, and our sister agency is the FDA, and we have had many conversations with them because they are the ones that approve what tests go on the market, and they approve the product inserts that have the test names and all about the test. And at this time, they are not willing to limit the types of names based on what comes in. So we don't really have a good mechanism right now to standardize test names. But what we could work on are possibly the mechanisms I mentioned to have IT tools to help with test selection. And also, if there are areas that could be standardized easily or be able to be linked or connected, such as I mentioned in when you're doing your programming, where you could have a one type of lab test name that could be mapped to many different other ones then clinician would only have to order or know one name, but then it would go to different test names. Maybe that would be helpful as well. Can you give permission to put some information on my website? Please send me an email, and what we can do is I can find out about how we can work that out. I am, even though I work with great IT people at CDC, I have to use them as the way to, to get things accomplished. But I do believe that what we have to offer at CDC, we would love to have you posted on your website. So please send me some information about how we can do that. And if there are some connections between what you're doing, we may be able to provide a link from our website to your website as well. So if you have something that you think would be valuable in posting, of course, we do have to go through an, a very detailed CDC review before we post things. But we are looking for good models of practice, good things that we can share, whether they're education programs, their ways to have good algorithms that have been developed, new types of clinical decision support tools. We're interested in those types of, of items, and we can share them as well. Let's see if there, there's, yes, he, he already responded. I don't believe I see any more questions, and we are about out of time. So with that, I want to thank you all for your time today, and I do hope that our paths will cross in the future. If not, then I appreciate your time, and you have a great day, and I wish you good luck in improving laboratory utilization in your own healthcare facility. Goodbye.